Welcome back to educator.com. Today we're going to go over the presidency and the bureaucracy. I'm sure this is everyone's favorite, so let's uh, dive right in here. All right, uh, four main objectives uh, in, in today's lecture. We're going to we're going to define the functions and characteristics unique to the American bureaucracy. We're going to describe some of the influence influences on the uh, federal bureaucracy, and then we're going to compare and contrast uh, the roles of the cabinet departments and the executive office of the president. Uh, that's probably going to be the main focus, the idea between, you know, what, what's the difference between the White House chief of staff and the secretary of state. So understand the dynamics of the relationship um, that these individuals have with the president. And then we're going to discuss some of the common complaints uh, about the bureaucracy. Uh, so what is the bureaucracy? The bureaucracy is basically a systematic way of organizing a complex and large administrative structure. So each president, they're going to deal with the bureaucracy in, in a different manner. So um, what new president comes into office will definitely uh, have have an effect on how a, a bureaucracy is run. So uh, again, it really depends on uh, the personal style of each president. Uh, but one thing is is for certain. Um, the the single largest employer in the United States um, is the federal government, so it's a huge bureaucracy, and um, as such, there are a lot of different um, facets to this bureaucracy. Uh, again, generally divided into four basic types. Um, you have cabinet departments, independent executive agencies, independent regulatory agencies, and government corporations. So there are uh, four different types of uh, general um uh, types of uh, bu you know, how, how bureaucracy is divided into. So you have the cabinet departments, independent executive agencies, uh, independent regulatory agency, and then you have government corporations. Here. So what are uh, what are uh, the cabinet departments? There are 15 departments, the most recent being uh, Homeland Security. It was created in 2002, uh, you know, in response to the September 11th attacks. So uh, they're originally uh, only only a handful, um, but you know there are 15 different uh, executive departments, and you know some of the ones we'll go over all the specific ones, but you know couple couple ones that uh, that stand out. You have the Department of State, um, headed by you know John John Kerry. Uh, originally it was uh, Hillary Clinton's job under Obama. Uh, Defense, which is actually headed by a Republican uh, Chuck Hagel. Uh, Obama actually appointed a Republican, which um, you know presidents will generally choose members of his or her own own party. But once in a while, um, president will will tap uh, a member of the opposing party to be Secretary of Defense or something along those lines. And Attorney General Eric Holder. Um, again, these are you know more prominent uh, cabinet level positions. Again, um, the head is appointed by the president, but subject to um, Senate confirmation. So you see separation of powers, the president appointing, um, and the Senate is confirming, but again, there's some checks and balances. The president can't just appoint um, anyone to uh, the cabinet. Again, these are high-profile positions usually right when the president, <coughs> excuse me, right when the president is deciding um, a lot of different things, uh, cabinet-level positions, uh, they probably rank as being one of the more uh, important things that uh, a president does in regards to his or her administration. Uh, again, there's some independent executive agency, and these are very similar to departments, but they don't have the cabinet level status. So these um, independent executive agencies, uh, again, they're subject to <coughs> they're subject to a Senate confirmation, but they uh, they don't have that type of cabinet level status. And then there are independent regulatory agencies. So this was created to regulate apart from the executive. The whole idea of this is to give uh, the uh, the regulating board um, separate authority apart uh, from the president. Uh, for example, the SC, SEC, they regulate um, things regarding uh, securities and the Exchange Commission. Um, the Federal Reserve, Reserve Board um, recently... Uh, President Obama um, actually appointed Janet Yellen to be the first female to head the Federal Reserve uh, Federal Reserve Board. So she's the chairman. Um, 
chairman uh, of the Fed. Again, that's a fairly significant position. And um, again, it's subject to, it's a position that's subject to Senate confirmation, but again, the president decides. And usually the, uh, the, the Fed chairman no longer is really uh, beholden. Uh, it's not really working for the president anymore, working for the interests of the American public. And then you have government corporations. Uh, and what they do, they carry out business-like activities. So they're trying to generate profit. Um, you have the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, United States Post Office, and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. So the problem with these company or these government-like corporations, if you take a look at the United States Post Office, uh, they don't really do a great job in, in turning a profit, uh, partly because it's it's not run like a uh, a private company. So there's even though their 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 goal is to make profit, uh, uh, there's there's not really uh, as much of a drive for the post office to make profit as there would be with a company like FedEx or uh, UPS. But again, these are these are basically the four different ways that our American bureaucracy is actually divided into. So what are some characteristics of the American bureaucracy? Well, uh, political authority is shared. And that's going to be a common theme, the idea that uh, no one individual actually controls the bureaucracy uh, by both the president uh, and Congress. And most agencies share functions with similar agencies in state and local governments. So you can actually use uh, uh, bureaucracy as an example of how uh, power is divided uh, within the national government. So that's the idea that there, there's a lot of shared powers between the executive and, and legislative, but also uh, on, on a federal level. So what the national government does, there's some redundancy or there's some cooperation, depending on how you look at it, uh, between states and the national government. So there's, um, there's an example of federalism in action there. So no one entity really controls uh, the bureaucracy. It's just it's one of those things where um, there's a, you know, everyone has, um, you know, a little bit of say and uh, the benefit in that is no one person really controls it. The downside, obviously, is something goes awry, then it's hard to really pinpoint the blame on, on either Congress or the president um, or again, any individual entity because there's so many, so much shared accountability. Uh, again, uh, the reason why bureaucracy actually has a lot of power, though, is the, the main source of bureaucratic power comes from its discretionary authority. Okay, what that means is the following. So Congress describes what gets done. So Congress can enact a law, you know, you, you, this agency must carry out so and so, but they, they're, they're vague in what uh, has to be done in order to carry this out. And so these bureaucracies, they, they have a lot of discretionary authority as to how to carry out the will of Congress. Um, so again, Congress describes what's, what gets done, but the agency may create specific regulations that are in accordance with these congressional mandates. So this gives uh, these bureaucracies incredible amounts of authority. Uh, the, the IRS, for example, uh, you know, they, there are a lot of different things that the IRS can do in terms of, uh, of, of doing what its mandate is in terms of collecting taxes. So uh, the head of the IRS, they can uh, create a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of leeway in, in how um, the head of the agency can run the organization. So again, Congress has general mandates and again, the head of each bureaucratic organization, they pretty much get to decide uh, a whole lot of things. So they have a lot of discretionary authority. Now, again, some agencies uh, deal directly with the American public. Like I mentioned, uh, everyone's favorite agency, the Internal Revenue Service, IRS while other agencies work with state and local governments. And so individuals don't really uh, contact them. They're, they're, they work in conjunction with state and local organizations like the Department of Education. Now, what are, again, what are some main influences on the federal bureaucracy? So we're going to pinpoint uh, three here. So there's executive influences. There's congressional influences. And then uh, Iron Triangle, we'll discuss you know, what this iron triangle actually means here. So you have uh, these three different influences on the federal bureaucracy. So executive in in influences. Well, again, the president appoints people. Again, that's that's something that the executive has power over in, in a lot of areas. 
Um, so that's, that's basically the main thing. Uh, the president's ability to select an individual that's going to head a, a bureaucratic organization. Um, and again, the president can issue executive orders in which it is basically the responsibility uh, of, of these bureaucracies to follow the mandate of the president via the executive order. And again, um, I mentioned before, it really is the personality of the president to actually reorganize uh, different agencies according to his personal um, managing style. Okay. And then you also have congressional influences. So whereas the president actually makes appointments, uh, you know, there's, you know, Congress that they influence the appointments. Uh, they're going to hold hearings. You know, there's uh, every, every individual is going to be scrutinized. Again, depending on the level, the level of uh, a bureaucracy, high level versus uh, low ranking, um, you know, high level uh, officials are going to be subject to greater scrutiny. And again, uh, they're going to write legislation impacting agencies, which again, agencies have a lot of discretionary power, but again, it's, it's these um, congressional influences that dictate what these bureaucracies are going to actually do. Uh, and, and this is where the Iron Triangle might, uh, might exist. So this, regard, this is in regards to like a bureaucracy, uh, a congressional committee, and interest groups. So these three, um, you know, corners of the Iron Triangle, they're going to basically, um, you know, wield a lot of power in terms of how, um, how these, uh, uh, you know, relationship structures and how things actually get done in Congress. So, um, let's see, these, these alliances, these Iron Triangles, um, first part would be the bureaucracy. Okay. Second part would be the interest groups. Again, the, the goal of the interest group. <laughs> <clears throat> the goal of an interest group is to basically, um, the goal of an interest group is to figure out what uh, legislation is going to impact its members uh, positively. And, and so they're going to work with the bureaucracy to, to try to get favorable uh, legislation passed or they're going to do what they can to, to basically, um, you know, lobby uh, these congressional committees. Okay. So one example might be a, a bureaucracy might be, uh, you know, dealing with uh, the Bureau of uh, Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. And then an interest group might be like the NRA. And then the Congressional Committee could be um, a committee dealing with, uh, uh, you know, firearm regulations, uh, something along those lines. So there, there there's going to be a line. There's going to be individuals that, you know, work closely in each of these three arenas. Uh, and again, there's there's probably a chance there's a lot of uh, you know cozy relationships that that take place uh, within this alliance. And so some people think that um, you know that's just the way Washington gets done, where where individuals are going to be um, uh, within that iron triangle. So if you're outside that sphere, uh, you're not going to really have too much power. And again, uh, it's it's not necessarily always bad. Congress and the president oftentimes defer to their influence simply because. Uh, they're the experts. The, the NRA, they're going to have all the information regarding, um, you know, uh, statistics and and uh, all these different things. And, and um, you know, the, the Bureau of uh, uh, Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, they're going to be kind of, um, they're going to be filled with uh, individuals that, that have experience in that arena. And then these congressional committees, uh, they're going to have a lot of uh, uh, experience, you know, passing laws and legislation uh, regarding uh, regarding firearms. So again, that's just one one example. Uh, as far as the AP test is concerned, just make sure uh, the number one priority is to understand you have the bureaucracy, you have the interest group, and you have the congressional committees all working together towards passage of uh, legislation. Now again, uh, there's a lot of uh, you know um, revolving door effect where. Uh, individuals from um, the you know interest groups they exit and they enter the bureaucracy. Um, they're former Congress members that uh, end up lobbying. There are actually some ethics rules. If you leave Congress, um, I, I believe there's a, a year waiting period of time before you can uh, enter uh, into an industry, so that you can't directly benefit uh, from having worked um, with uh, certain interest groups. But uh, there's a you know a lot of individuals they you know, wait that year or take on roles that aren't directly in regards to lobbying. Uh, so there, there are ways that 
that a former congressman can get can get paid uh, or benefit basically from their uh, time in Congress. Uh, so again, former Congress members might have lucrative private sector jobs awaiting them upon leaving the public sector. For example, Senate uh, former Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle uh, started his own consulting firm. Um, and again, a as such, um, there's a lot of influence that I'm sure um, uh, he is familiar with, and you know, having having that experience, it definitely helps him out. Uh, Again, another individual, J.C. Watts, he ended his uh, congressional ca career, um, you know, in, in the mid '90s, and uh, he he was able to uh, parlay his uh, uh, experience and you know exit and uh, get into lobbying. So uh, one of the destinations a lot of these congressmen um, go towards after their political careers are over are basically into these interest groups and. Again, if you if you go into that field, you're going to have a lot of influence, and you're going to have built a lot of relationships with uh, fellow congressmen. So it, it becomes a very convenient arrangement for a lot of these politicians. Now, the executive office of the president. What the heck is that? This was actually established in 1939. Um, again, each president relies on different agencies depending on preference. So, uh, President uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Um, he basically reorganized the office, making uh, the White House office a little bit more uh, fully staffed, so to speak. Uh, prior to FDR, uh, there, there wasn't as much of a systematic way of organizing um, the White House staff. So the executive office of the president is, uh, was created, again, to, to basically fill the, uh, the roles um, that's basically required for the presidency being such a demanding role. And again, some key, some key uh, agencies would be the White House Office, National Security Council, and then the Office of Management and Budget, the OMB. And so these are just three different examples of uh, the executive office of the president. Now, the White House Office, this is basically where if you watch a lot of movies uh, really dealing with the president, for example, uh, Dave. Um, the the movie the pre the premise of Dave is uh, a movie in which uh, President Bill Mitchell suffers a stroke, and there's a body double that basically assumes the role of the presidency. Well, uh, there are two key members of uh, Bill Mitchell's staff that are in on this conspiracy, and they're basically part of the White House office. You have the chief of staff, whose main loyalty is to the president of the United States. You have the chief of staff, and then you have the press secretary. So. You have certain positions that uh, basically their their primary goal is uh, loyalty to the president. They're basically an extension of the president. So a lot of these presidential movies, they kind of highlight um, this uh, uh, reality that the White House office, they're there to serve the president. Whereas we'll discuss about cabinet members, that's not necessarily the case. But with the White House office, uh, the number one goal is to serve the president of the United States. And uh, your interests are basically aligned with that of the president's, which is not necessarily the case uh, with cabinet level officials. Again, in theory, it, it really should be, but uh, the the nature of of the job dic might dictate otherwise. So again, um, White House office personal and, and political staff members include the chief of staff, uh, counsel to the president, and press secretary. Uh, another popular TV uh, series, The West Wing. Uh, the West Wing basically details uh, uh, the the daily happenings of what it's like in the White House office. You're not going to see a whole lot of cabinet members. Uh, cabinet members, they have their own um, issues. They're basically leaders of their own uh, bureaucratic organizations, whereas the White House staff, uh, again, their primary objective is to serve the president of the United States. You have the National Security uh, Council. Uh, basically, the NSC, they... Um, you know, advise the president on security concerns, both domestic and foreign. Probably two of the most notable uh, National Security uh, Council um, uh, advisors uh, were by Henry Kissinger and Condoleezza Rice. Now, incidentally, um, uh, some of the, the duties of, of, of the job actually overlap with that of a Secretary of State. And um, interestingly enough, Henry Kissinger actually ended up becoming Secretary of State, as did Condoleezza Rice. So 
again, really depends on the president, whether uh, the president is going to rely more on, on the advice of the NSC or Secretary of State. Uh, it, it's really up to the president's governing style. And then you have the man, Office of Management and Budget. Uh, again, their, their job is to help the president craft an annual budget, which is, again, subject to Senate confirmation, which is uh, one of the few positions that is subject to uh, Senate confirmation uh, because uh, chief of staff, uh, uh, press secretary, a, a lot of these offices um, uh, within the EOP, they are not subject to Senate confirmation, but the OMB is. And finally, most staff, again, uh, not subject to Senate confirmation. And again, they tend to mean lo loyalties to the president more so than the heads of cabinet departments. And, and why is this? And as I explained, uh, if, if you are the chief of staff, your goal is to manage the day-to-day uh, the -day affairs of the president of the United States. If you are the secretary of defense, your job is to manage the day today affairs or um, you're basically almost like the, the president of a, a huge organization uh, you know em employees of a couple hundred thousands um, and so your job is to manage them and set rules and dictate standards and uh, sometimes it can become uh, at odds with um, the goals of the president again so the key or the three original or three of the original departments you had the state department 1789 the Treasury, 1789, and you had Defense, 1789 as well. And you also had the, um, not actually a, a secretary position, but you had uh, the Attorney General as well. But the Secretary of State, um, what do they do? The Secretary of State um, advises the President on foreign policy, uh, negotiates treaties, represents the United States abroad. So it, you're going to log a lot of frequent flyer miles if you're the Secretary of State. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of... Um, um, diplomatic things that, that are required of the Secretary of State. Now, normally, the Secretary of State in, in modern times has not been a stepping stone to the presidency. Um, the exception being, again, Hillary Clinton was Obama's Secretary of State. Um, interesting, uh, had she been the vice presidential candidate, uh, it might have been a situation that could have worked, but Hillary Clinton uh, was offered the Secretary of State position, and again, she is seen, you know, as, as a possible leading contender for the presidency in, in 2016. So it's not without precedent for a uh, uh, a secretary of state to make the jump to the presidency. Again, obviously, there's all these uh, other positions. Uh, for example, John Kerry. John Kerry uh, used to be a senator from Massachusetts, uh, uh, <coughs> presidential candidate in 2004, and you know, became the Secretary of State under uh, Obama's administration. Probably not a future presidential candidate, uh, but this is uh, th this is a very prominent position. Probably one of the 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 most uh, one of the most, if not the most prominent uh, secretary um, cabinet level position. And again, Colin Powell. Uh, Colin Powell never actually ran for president, but was always considered to be a, a possible presidential candidate. Uh, you know, having a military background, but also uh, being uh, Secretary of uh, of State and also Secretary of Defense. So one of these things that um, uh, to be able to have that on your resume um, definitely is uh, something that adds to your presidential credentials. Secretary of Treasury, uh, the first Secretary of Treasury was actually Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton was our first Secretary of Treasury. So what does Secretary of Treasury do? Uh, they oversee the production of coins and currency, uh, the disbursement of payments to the public, revenue collection and funds to run the federal government. So again, Alexander Hamilton, who is featured on the $10 bill, he was our first uh, Secretary of uh, Treasury. And uh, one, one Secretary of Treasury that actually highlights the idea that uh, the interests of the president may not be the same as the interests of the uh, uh, the secretary, uh, Paul O'Neill was actually the uh, individual that was selected to be the Secretary of Treasury under uh, President George W. Bush's administration. But uh, uh, Paul O'Neill didn't see eye to eye with uh, the president in terms of uh, in terms of his stance with tax cuts, and so he was vocal in his opposition, and he was eventually fired for. Uh, 
not necessarily insubordinates, but uh, basically not following uh, the line of the administration. So, uh, you know, a cabinet member, uh, they they generally are not going to see I eye to eye on every matter. Now, are they going to be loyal to the president? Uh, yeah, mo oftentimes, most of the time they, they, they will. But again, depending on uh, uh, the goals, you, you have a goal of running a department versus uh, advising the presidents. And, and uh, a lot of the times they're, they're very commonly aligned, uh, but sometimes they're not. So um, uh, cabinet, cabinet members definitely can be a little bit more vocal in their opposition uh, again, compared to the White House office, uh, Timothy Geithner, uh, he was the 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 first Secretary of Treasury under Obama's administration. Uh, he actually um, ran into a little problems during the uh, Senate confirmation hearings because uh, he had failed to pay Social Security taxes uh, on some of his earnings, and uh, it was kind of an interesting situation because uh, an individual who basically um, was the head of the IRS, um, basically did not correctly understand uh, certain tax laws. Now, he ended up paying uh, the taxes that he uh, owed, but again, it kind of showed you uh, the idea that these, you know, these bureaucracies, uh, there's a lot of red tape, and it's one of the common uh, complaints about uh, bureaucracy, all the red tape and, and not knowing these certain rules and regulations, and how can an, an average individual navigate the bureaucracy like the IRS when even uh, the individual who was appointed to head the Department of Treasury and therefore the IRS couldn't even do so. So uh, there are valid complaints about uh, the structure and organization of the bureaucracy. And then you had the, uh, the, you have the Secretary of Defense, which originally was actually not called that, um, but it's kind of morphed into that uh, cabinet position. So originally it was actually the Department of War, but that really sounds too too much like you're you're, you're trying to fight, start something. So it was actually combined with the Department of uh, with combined with Navy in 1947, and then basically it's the Department of Defense. Basically, they manage the armed forces and operates military bases. But again, um, Obama tapped uh, Chuck Chuck Hagel, a Republican, to head uh, the Department of Defense. Um, maybe as a way to to throw an olive leaf uh, across the aisle um, to try to uh, use foreign policy as a as a bipartisan um, issue. Um, and w another thing that's kind of interesting: Donald Rumsfeld was Secretary of Treasury or not Treasury of Defense under Gerald Ford in 1974, 1977, and he was the youngest uh, Secretary of Defense at the time. And simultaneously, he was appointed by Bush Jr. Um, during his term uh, as president. And he was also the oldest. He was the oldest Secretary of Defense. So I thought that's kind of an interesting distinction to have been the youngest um, and then to have been the oldest. So uh, the time span in which he served uh, two different tenures at, at, at the Defense Department um, was uh, nearly 30 years. Um, and also Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney served as the Secretary of Defense under the the first George Bush's administration, and then later uh, became the Vice President under the second George Bush's administration. So, a lot of these positions with uh, with the State, uh, Treasury, and Defense, they're very prominent roles, and they have a lot of uh, influence. And uh, again, there's no necessary. There's no prerequisites, no constitutional prerequisites for a lot of these positions. But again, most of these individuals, uh, particularly defense, uh, they're going to have had uh, military experience um, or uh, congressional experience uh, for the most part. But there are no formal requirements for these cabinet level positions. Now, what are some other executive departments? You have the Secretary of Interior. Uh, what do they do? They manage federal lands, uh, uh, refuges and, and parks. Uh, Department of Justice, uh, again, they provide legal advice, enforce federal laws, and represent the U.S. in courts. And, and there, are, there are others. So there's agriculture, commerce, labor. What they do is they, um, they you know, every, every Friday, one of the, the goals of, or one of the duties of the, um, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, which falls under labor, they report 
uh, government data on unemployment, inflation, and uh, and such figures. Health and Human Services took on a prominent role with uh, Obamacare. Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, um, they uh, they provide um, uh, a lot of uh, they oversee a lot of regulations and uh, provide subsidized housing for individuals on, on low income. So they provide uh, a lot of uh, uh, regulations for, for companies to maintain. Transportation, energy, education, veterans affairs, and homeland security. So there's a total of 15 departments, uh, cabinet level departments currently in the United States. Um, now, one, one kind of interesting fact here. Uh, yeah, again, as the, the, as far as the AP exam is concerned, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get a whole lot of questions on the specifics of each cabinet level administration. In fact, one of the questions is not gonna be how many cabinet level uh, positions are there. Um, it, it is good to know the, the roles of the prominent, um, cabinet level departments. And again, it's not necessary to know specific individuals. That being said, one of the, one of the interesting things that, um, has kind of, uh, developed as tradition over time is that uh, when the State of the Union address is given um, at the end of January or beginning of February, uh, again, the President is required by the Constitution to give a State of the Union address. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be televised, but that's what it, it has become over the years. You have a very uh, potentially dangerous situation. You have the, the President of the United States addressing the nation, and right behind the President, you have the Vice President of the United States and right next to the vice president, you have uh, the you have the speaker of the house. So you have the first in line to the presidency, and you have the second in line to the presidency. And the president is addressing both houses of Congress. Um, a lot of the cabinet members will attend, and you have uh, you know the judiciary. So you have all uh, you have heads of each the legislative, executive, and uh, judicial branch all in one building. So uh, it's a security, it's a huge security risk. As such, what they will do is uh, they'll do the following. So every year during the president's State of the Union address, one lower level cabinet member does not attend the speech just in case, just in case something happens and, and uh, you know, security protocol goes awry and, and you no longer have uh, the president or, or Congress. You have a cabinet member, uh, you know, I don't know specifically, maybe like the 15th or 16th down in the line of presidency after the president, vice president, speaker of the house, uh, president pro tempore. After you keep on going down to the line of lower level cabinet members, um, you hit upon uh, an individual that basically could become the president of the United States in the case of uh um, you know, a terrorist attack of some sort. So kind of interesting. We would have had our first Asian American president if that were the case. Uh, on February 12, 2013, it was Secretary of Energy Stephen Chu that was uh, chosen to, to be whisked away by the Secret Service. Um, again, usually a kind of very interesting experience for that cabinet member. Uh, it was, it was during, towards the end of his, uh, uh, end of his position. So, um, Again, uh, he he decided, yeah, he something that would be kind of interesting. Didn't have to watch uh, the present State of the Union address live. And then the following year, um, uh, January twenty eighth of uh, two thousand fourteen, Secretary of Energy Ernest uh, Moniz, uh, he was uh, the chosen individual just in case. So it's one of the things, one of the kind of the random things that's kind of interesting about uh, these lower level cabinet uh, officials, whether it's going to be. Uh, the Secretary of Energy or, or Veterans Affairs or Housing and uh, Urban Development. Usually that individual is whisked away just in case uh, the unthinkable happens. So what are some common problems with the bureaucracy? Again, uh, this has been um, kind of uh, talked about, uh, but it's, it's this idea of red tape. It creates just too many rules and procedures that slow down the process, especially during periods of divided government. So uh, when you have a Republican Congress and you have a Democrat president or vice versa, it's tough enough to get things done. And the, the problem with bureaucratic organizations is that because it's run by the federal government, not only do you have different priorities with different political parties, but you have the, the added layer of red tape. So uh, it can get a little frustrating. And uh, that's, again, that's probably the the major complaint that people have with uh, bureaucracy. And again, with that, you're going to get duplication and conflict. Uh, that creates redundancy and inefficiency. 
Uh, and just the nature of uh, bureaucracy, it's just easier to block action than to take action. And people are frustrated when things don't get done. Well, it's kind of built into the system. Things don't get done because um, the way that bureaucracies are organized, uh, having to deal with the presidency, uh, Congress, and um, figuring this and, and that, uh, it's easier to stop things from happening than it is to actually proactively get things done. And again, bureaucrats uh, are difficult to fire. So rather than deal with the cumbersome process, many are allowed to just stay in their position because, because of the difficulty in, in firing uh, individuals working for the federal government, sometimes um, it, it's simply better to try to get that person to retire or, uh, again, it's not structured like the private sector where uh, there's necessarily a bottom line in terms of profit. So um, sometimes it's, again, easier not to directly fire but just kind of hide um, incompetent individuals. Um, again, because the Constitution stays silent on the issue of bureaucracy, it's up to both the President, Congress, um, and also individual agencies to collectively decide how to enact public policy. And again, that being the case, there's a lot of individuals that have some say in what these bureaucracies uh, can do. And again, the bureaucratic organizations themselves, they have uh, a lot of discretionary power. And again, their incentives not, might not be completely aligned with that of the presidency or Congress. So um, that that's just one of the... Uh, the realities of, uh, of the bureaucracy. So that being said, here, let's go to some examples here. Which of the following is not considered to be part of the executive office of the president? So let's see which, one, uh, which ones are part of the executive office of the presidency. National Security Council, absolutely. Uh, White House office, absolutely. The OMB, which is one of the few uh, uh, positions within the the EOP that is subject to Senate confirmation, absolutely. Council of Economic Advisors, absolutely. Uh, State Department, that is uh, absolutely incorrect, and therefore it is the correct answer. State Department. The State Department is a cabinet-level position, and again, their interests are going to uh, not necessarily be aligned with that of the president. Okay, question number two, example number two. Uh, which of the following individuals is most likely to serve the interests of the president as his or her first, first priority. So who's going to serve the President of the United States? Is it going to be the White House Chief of Staff? Absolutely. Okay, um, uh, one of the more uh, recent um, White House Chief of Staff who actually uh, left to uh, uh, become mayor of Chicago, uh, Ram Emanuel. And uh, uh, he was known as being um, uh, someone that ran a, a tight ship and Originally, when Obama selected him, um, you know, Obama was seen someone as not, um, you know, as kind of a relatively new politician. So, choosing Ram Ram Emanuel, who's uh, uh, nicknamed Rambo uh, for for good reason, uh, someone who would organize the office and and uh, maybe uh, do a lot of the the, the dirty work uh, that's sometimes required in politics. So again, the White House Chief of Staff. Um, that person's first priority is going to, at least publicly, is going to be to serve the President of the United States. Not necessarily the Secretary of State, nor the Secretary of Treasury, nor the Secretary of Defense, and not necessarily the Federal Reserve Chairman. Again, all these individuals are not going to necessarily uh, openly sabotage the presidency, but again, their interests are um, of, of, of trying to protect the president is not necessarily going to be their first instinct. Okay, third example, uh, which of the following cabinet positions was the most recently created in 2012? Uh, and this, this one's a fairly straightforward question here. Uh, not state, defense, or treasury. Those are the first three. So choosing between homeland security or ed education. Um, education was created uh, uh, later on. Um, and actually, it was, it was a department that uh, Reagan actually proposed to eliminate because it was created in the 70s. Uh, but that never really gained any traction. Uh, so there is some federal influence on education policy in the United States, and it runs through the Secretary of Education. Uh, but the most recent um, cabinet-level position was Secretary of Homeland Security, which coordinates now the FBI, CIA, uh, a, a lot of these um, uh, organizations under one, um, one secretary. Uh, the problem that 
that that was encountered in um, uh, in the events leading up to the September 11th uh, attacks in 2001 was that a lot of these agencies, the CIA, the FBI, they weren't they weren't working together. So um, there was a push in in Congress to create a new cabinet level position to address that uh, that need. Okay, example number four. All the following accurately describe the usual relationship between the president and cabinet heads except. Okay, so uh, what describes this, uh, the usual relationship here? Uh, the department secretaries act independently independently from the president. And that yeah, that's absolutely the case. So that's not the answer. They, they do act independently. Because again, not only are they appointed by the president, uh, and confirmed by the Senate, but now they're basically almost like the CEO of the organization. Uh, a huge, uh, huge bureaucracy to navigate. So you're leaving your imprint on the organization, and uh, you know you you you, you want to be successful independently of the president. Yeah. Cabinet members spend the majority of the time managing and leading their own departmental business. Absolutely. Just like the president is in charge of his own. Um, uh, office and cabinet members. Uh, the cabinet heads, they're in charge of, of, of creating policy and protocol and building morale within uh, the own department. Cabinet members seek to promote their own departments and cabinet meetings. Absolutely. Uh, there's a finite amount of resources and each cabinet member is probably going to lobby for increased uh, budget spending for his or her department. Cabinet members can sometimes seek their interests at the expense of the administration's interests. Absolutely. You're going to see a lot more, um, uh, lo lot more public uh, displays of disloyalty with cabinet members than you are with the chief of staff, for example. It's just again, just the nature of the position. And then cabinet members are required to implement the president's policy decisions. Uh, not required. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, you you were appointed by the president, and your job is to implement the policies. But it's not necessarily the case. The cabinet members are given a lot of discretionary authority in in how they're going to enact certain policies. Now, again, the president can ask for your resignation, uh, in essence, uh, fire you, and so the president has the right to do that. But uh, certainly, cabinet members are not required to follow a hundred percent of what the president has decided to do. And the final example here is this here. Which of the following statements is true in regards to the bureaucracy? Well, let's take a look here. Most agencies' functions do not overlap with those of other, other agencies. No, that's, that's absolutely not true. Uh, federal agencies and local and state, they work together. Again, there's some redundancies, but uh, they'll cooperate with one another. Agencies have a high degree of discretionary power to make decisions regarding implementation of policy. Absolutely. This is the correct answer. Uh, again, bureaucracies, they have, they have power because as, as, uh, civil servants, they, they, they maintain their positions and th they're gonna see different administrations come and go. But a lot of these agencies, uh, they have a lot of discretion in how they're gonna exercise, uh, these congressional mandates and executive orders. Most agencies do not work with related agencies in state and local gov government. Uh, that is incorrect. They do work with, uh, agencies. The bureaucracy is controlled solely by the president. That is not the case. The president has a huge say, especially in appointment powers, but uh, there's a lot of divided powers as well. The bureaucracy is controlled solely by Congress. And again, that's not the case. The president and Congress, uh, they both work together in, in controlling different aspects of the bureaucracy. Thank you for watching Educator.com.